welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafiroff, and today with us we have a fascinating man, Vinny Lavien. He was the head and continues to be the head of the emergency task force for the entire Catholic Church in New York City. Vinny, so nice to have you on well, the show, nice and thank you, thank you very, very much for everything you've done. And can you tell our audience exactly what is the emergency task force? Sure. So after uh, March 16th, March 17th, I went to uh, my boss, Bishop DiMaggio, in the Diocese of Brooklyn, and I wanted to help. I have a logistical background. I used to do a lot of White House advance from the President of the United States. used to travel. I was the front man to handle all the logistics, worked in government for years. So and with I, which president? Uh, president Clinton, uh, President Obama, uh, and I actually did some for President Trump as well. So I'm, from, I'm independent, so I consider myself you know, very bipartisan. Uh, so obviously doing the work for the Catholic Church. I do the government affairs for the Catholic Church, city, state, federal. So I'm the one that's lobbying for Catholic charities and homeless shelters and Catholic education and Catholic migration services. I've been doing that for, for nine years. So I wanted to take my skill, and I worked down at Ground Zero for six months on another emergency task force where I worked for the government. Wonderful. And I have a unique uh, background in logistics and just being able to get, to get things done. So I went to my boss, and he gave me, uh, and Senior Harrington and the bishop gave me their full blessing and said, you know, go out and help people. So I uh, immediately, March 16th, March 17th, when everybody remembers the schools were shutting down and St. Patrick's Day uh, parade was canceled, and the governor and mayor said, stay in, it's not safe to be home. We got activated, and I uh, basically hired people, a few people that I worked with down at Ground Zero. One of them, ironically, is Rob Rich, who is a uh, photographer. Uh, out did, here in the Hamptons. Out, out here sure. in the Hamptons. He, uh, I met him after 9-11, and I basically called people that I knew that had logistical backgrounds that I worked with down at Ground Zero, and I said, you know, you want to help? A lot of them, I have to say, a person like Rob and other people that worked with me, uh, they were afraid, they were scared, and I said, listen, you know, this is the mission. It obviously, it's a very serious mission, and you're going to put your own life at stake. I have pre-existing health uh, conditions for working down at Ground Zero. My wife, uh, I have two children, uh, Sophia, nine, and Vinny, Jr., seven. My wife, every day, was actually very emotional, me leaving the house. Very worried that uh, you might come down with COVID, right? Absolutely. And back sure. then, nobody knew how serious it was. Uh, but Very no, serious, yeah, as was, we found out, yeah. right? And I remember yeah. the entire the entire country just about shut down. Yeah. In New York, we were one of the first because yeah. we we were hit so hard with COVID. Yeah. And um, it's amazing that you started this. So you founded the emergency task force. And what did that mean? What did that entail? What did you do exactly? So I knew early on uh, the procurement wasn't there for the hospitals, the doctors. They Catholic. didn't have the supplies. They didn't have I mean, the, I, they we all read them. they didn't have yeah. masks. Yeah. They didn't have ventilators. Yeah. They didn't have gowns, yep. so you went out and got these Yeah, so things. basically through my sourcing, uh, the White House advanced logistics background, we, I physically went out and we started finding people where we could get the gloves, the masks, the sanitizer from. A lot of people I worked with are logistical experts, so we found literally locations in New York City that had them. And then we went to the vendors and said, all right, you know, we need the masks, gloves, and sanitizers. And we would then pick them up and then we would drop them off at NYU Langone, New York Cornell, uh, Health and Hospital Corporation, you know, Mamamides. At one point early on, uh, a very uh, close friend of mine uh, that does uh, a lot of the management uh, for uh, Sony Records, Disruptor Records, through uh, the chain smokers, reached out to me and they said, we have a contact with a pizzeria that wants to donate pizza. So Source Pizza, uh, Adam and Perry, who own it on Low East Side, donated up to 20,000 uh, pizza pies throughout New York City. We basically got vehicles and dropped off uh, the food throughout uh, 45 hospitals every day for about uh, three months. Rob Rich, who you know, was one of those drivers of those vehicles. People don't realize back then, everything was shut down. Everything was locked down. It was a I war zone. I remember well, yeah. and I happen to have been out here, yeah. but I'm a New York City resident, yeah. and I remember very well the yeah. whole city locked down, and, yeah. and it's just starting to come alive yeah. again, the city right now. And so tell me, you, you needed donations, of course, yep. and you, you secured donations. Yep. And I understand people like Sandy Weil, yep. he helped uh, something to do with um, his plane. He gave you yep. his plane so he could transport yep. supplies to you. And yep. what other famous people were involved? I have to say a lot of people uh, just stepped up and people that uh, I did not know before or had really close relationships with. 
I mean, one of them, uh, the chain smokers, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're we know uh, them well out here yeah, in the Hamptons. And, 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 they it's they one had thing. the big concert, yeah. and they got into a lot of trouble yep. with um, Governor Cuomo yep. because of no social distancing. Yep. And for all our viewers, I think uh, you recall the chain smokers concert back in the summer of um, 2020, yep. and um, it went around the world that the chain smokers had this massive drive-in concert where people weren't supposedly social distanced enough. But what happened? I understand the chain smokers actually made a big donation yep. of masks, yep. right? Yep. And, and, and then um, what did they give exactly? Well, and then what happened after that? Did we have a big outbreak yep. of COVID or no? I have to say, so a lot of people don't know this. So early on in April, uh, Adam Halbert, who's the uh, CEO of Disruptive Records for Sony Records and Alexandra Caymans, that basically managed the chain smokers, reached out to me. Uh, beginning of April and said, you know, they want to help and they want to help basically below the radar, anonymous. They spent, you know, a lot of money. They uh, personally, Alex and Drew from the chain smokers spent over, uh, you know, over a hundred thousand dollars to help you uh, to help. And they, they donated 20,000 masks, uh, nice. 10,000. So we called Sandy Wilder, Wild Cornell. Um, and we, I personally picked up the mask and donated, you know, the 10,000 masks to New York. Now, now you understand this was uh, in the beginning of April, April 6th, April 7th, when nobody had any mask, and we, when we went in there, the doctors and the nurses, they were basically in triage. This was the point eight, you know, 900 people were dying every day. I remember very um, well, and the doctors yeah. and nurses didn't have proper they, they had masks or, or, or the gowns yeah. was a big issue, and yeah. they actually were wearing garbage bags. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so, so you provided uh, gowns and masks yeah. and then ventilators, yeah. and then, which is extraordinary because we've had such a... A difficult um, time with this yeah. COVID, and yeah. um, but a lot of people don't know, like some like that. Um, so the chain smokers, who I really did not know that well, uh, they were they went black, meaning they were they were in the middle of uh, doing a new album, so they were not on social media. There was no media on this. They literally just did the right thing. They then had ten thousand masks to go to UMC Medical Center in Vegas. We had a plane that was donated. I personally then took the ten ten thousand masks, flew to Vegas had the uh, sheriff's office in Vegas meet us. We went to UMC Medical Center, dr dropped off another 10,000 masks in Vegas. They have a daily, a weekly show at the Wynn, you know, through Steve mm -hmm, Wynn and mm -hmm. Encore. So here's, here's two guys that donated 20,000 masks, right, in April. Right? Nobody mm -hmm. even knew about it. Uh, other people started finding out about it just through the work that we did. Uh, fast forward four or five months later, they want to do a safe and sound concert in the Hamptons. Uh, all the money went to charity, right? They brought in this uh, very elaborate vendor that basically did social distancing for everybody. Uh, or they I, tried, yeah, or something yeah. went wrong. You know, though. I something was there happened. with my wife and my family. I have to say, and I, I ran a emergency task force for COVID. The last thing I would do was put my wife or my family, my cousins in harm's way. Uh, it was done very, very professional. The social distancing was there. What happens is somebody takes a picture and they see a crowd and they see people in the crowd. And everybody wants and to be... And a story begins. Of course. And, they, and it may not be a true story, yeah. but something happens. Now, one I know that went sick. around the world, that media. I now, remember. one person got sick. Now, one person got sick in the Hamptons. Now, one person was confirmed with COVID. But instead of saying, you know, you guys tried to do a good thing, and let's work on the first social distance, safe and sound concert that anybody ever did in the United States, it's, all, it's always gotcha. You know, the governor... And the, the health department, you know, God bless them for all the work that they do. Now one person got sick. So, I mean, they should be commended and thanked for the work that they did for the city. I mean, literally, the governor and the mayor should give them the key to the city. I mean, they did work in the beginning of April that nobody else did, and nobody even knows about it, right? Well, a lot uh, of people did a lot of things behind the scenes. Course, yeah. And I think what we saw was the entire country um, came together, and really the entire world, to try to... Uh, work on this horrible pandemic that we're still in the midst of and uh, we really don't know what's going to happen moving forward it looks like it might be i mean it's died down but is it coming back and that's the million dollar question um but and so you've been doing really amazing things and i I can't thank you enough, and I know uh, my involvement, I'm yeah. on the board of a hospital, and almost every single charity that I'm on the board of 
and other charities um, have all put together COVID funds yep. to help people. And one of the big issues that we've had is food insecurity yep. with so many millions. I think at one time we had 36 million Americans out of work. Now that number might be around, I don't know if it's 10, 12 yep. million. Um, but people didn't have food. And yep. I remember, um, getting involved myself personally with yeah. um, a local food pantry and then advocating on television for food pantries. Yeah. But you actually, you started a whole movement for the food pantries. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, so obviously for four months we were supplying uh, all the hospitals and Catholic charities and all the churches and all the first responders, police officers and firefighters for all the PPE, the mask, gloves and sanitizer. And then when that died down, um, I wanted to continue the mission. Uh, I'm honored I serve in the Silver Shield Foundation that was started by George Steinbrenner and uh, Howard Lauber mm -hmm. and Billy Walters and Robert De Niro and Chuck Scarborough and David Maross all serve in that foundation that helps police officers and firefighters kill line of duty. One of the board members, David Maross, is very close with Mark Bezos, uh, Jeff's brother. David basically reached out to Mark and said, you got to see what Vinny's doing. He's doing amazing work. He wants to continue the mission. So thankfully, Mark reached out to me, who used to be the senior vice president of Robin Hood Foundation, and said, let me see how Robin Hood could give you a grant and you can continue the mission. So Robin Hood approved the grant about a month and a half ago, and we went out into Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, and to Jamaica, Queens, and we found an amazing uh, food vendor called Serve Natural through the same uh, person, Alexandra Caymans, that helped us in the beginning with the chain smokers. And uh, Serve Natural has healthy food, uh, and was this food donated by the vendor, or was so, it individuals who purchased this? And and then Robin Hood, you mentioned, you gave a grant. How yeah. much was that grant so that Robin Hood gave? It was a $50,000 grant. Nice. And Good through, start. Through that grant uh, that Robin Hood uh, gave us, uh, majority of all that money went to the food vendor, Serve Natural. It's important to know that the food vendor, Serve Natural, Kyle and Jared Lyons, volunteered their times during COVID. Uh, they donated over $200,000 in food to the hospitals, the nurses and the doctors. They have healthy food, like grilled chicken and bison burgers that come in a refrigerated truck. Food that people really want to uh, eat. Yeah, it's and under 400 calories. And you know, a lot of these areas, I grew up in Brooklyn, so you go to Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, Jamaica, Brooklyn, uh, the inner city parts of New York City that people forget about. It's not a lot of healthy food. So I can say, I just spoke to pa Pastor Boyd that literally called me just now, wanting to know if you know the grant's gonna be extended because the people that wait on the line. When we show up, there's a line around the block. We give out 500 meals uh, every, every Tuesday and Wednesday in Jamaica and Bed-Stuy, we run out. We then started going into uh, different homeless shelters um, in, in Manhattan uh, and bringing the food. I had somebody, a good friend of mine from Morgan Stanley, Ed Sweeney, that donated $6,000 in food cards. That uh, basically the restaurant food cards that we can give out. So then we went into Manhattan the past two weeks to homeless shelters to give out food cards and serve natural to homeless. I don't think people really realize how bad uh, the food, uh, the lack of food in uh, neighborhoods are in New York City. A lot of these people that lost their jobs, they're not citizens, right? Wherever you think about the immigration issue, mm -hmm. uh, they don't, they're not getting unemployment, they're not getting payroll protection, and they lost their job in the restaurants. As you know, the restaurants are still closed in New York City. I've been dealing a lot with uh, you know, the owner of Bobby Vans, Joe Smith, who's actually out here in Bridgehampton. Uh, and other restaurant owners to open up the restaurants. Because what I've seen after COVID started, there was one uh, essential worker that was there every day and feeding New Yorkers and feeding the first responders, and that's all the restaurants. Yes, well, yeah. there's been a very serious uh, situation with food, whereas yeah. food pantries used to have 100 people on a line. Now yeah. those lines uh, might be eight or 900 yeah. people, and I don't see that changing yeah. right away. People, even if people go back to work, there was a period where they lost tremendous amount, and then we have so many people who lost their entire businesses, mostly the small and medium-sized business owners. And so this uh, food security in the United States will continue. Yep. And going back to Jeff Bezos, yep. I had read, and it was a wonderful thing yep. he did, he gave $100 million, uh, to um, Feeding America, yep. which is a massive uh, charity yep. th that supplies to many, many different food pantries yep. across the United States. But going back to you, Vinny, yep. I want a little give our audience a little um, background on you. Yep. I understand your father 
was an NYPD detective. What was that like growing up? And um, tell us, can you tell us some stories of what your dad did and, and yeah, you sure. as a young boy? Yeah. How did you deal with what he yeah. did? So, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn, right? Um, right? My father was a police officer, but my mom was a teacher. My dad in the early, so he was a Marine, enlisted in Vietnam, and in 1969 became a police officer. Uh, as you know, New York City was different in the 70s. Um, and he became a detective and went undercover and infiltrated the mafia. Uh, he went undercover in numerous cases, a gold bug case in which he was wired up and arrested uh, uh, 200 dirty cops. Uh, in the 70s, he then uh, infiltrated the Sicilian mafia and took a uh, big, uh, basically, mafia head down. The guy that he took Are down. Are you scared now? Uh, no, I had to say my dad, uh, my dad was, I think, a heroic hero for the city and for the work he did. Uh, we were the first police officer to be put in the Witness Protection Program uh, in the middle of the night in 1978. The streets of New York City were shut down and U.S. Marshals basically uh, escorted us out of the city because my dad had a hit on his life that the FBI and the police department thought it was so serious that we basically went cross country for six months uh, on the fear of somebody would kill him. I understand. Uh, you know, we came back. Uh, I was a kid. You know, I was How two old were you I then? was two years old. Oh, my so brother, you were very young. My brother was six. And you imagine... My mom had two kids, a two-year-old and a six-year-old, and... Well, she must have been scared. Yeah, scared, and, 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 and back and then... worried. Yeah. They, but you came back to New York. Yep. Yeah. I mean, we came back. My dad uh, was a very, uh, very strong-willed person. So they basically, back then, sat down with all the five families of all the organized crime families and basically said, if you go after, you know, this detective, we're going to shut everything down. Uh, ironically, about a month later, uh, this gentleman came to... My, my home and told my mom and basically said uh, the gentleman that uh, had the hit of my father's life said, you know, he carries no grudge. You and your family are all okay. Meaning the, the hit was off. They, they knew where we were. They knew where we lived. And they basically sent somebody to tell my mother in a very direct did way. did she believe that? Yeah, because the person that was there was obviously an organized crime uh, hitman telling her that we're not going to touch you and, uh, and your kids. So think... My dad did a lot of work with the President's Commission on Organized Crime, Ronald Reagan, worked for Joe Hines, the Brooklyn District Attorney. He did the Howard Beach case uh, with the racial and riots mm -hmm. in 1986 when four white kids chased a black kid onto the Bell Parkway. They did the lead investigator. Back then, Mario Cuomo, Governor Cuomo's father, was the governor. Joe Hines became the special prosecutor. That was a racially motivated case, if anybody remembers that. Uh, I remember. Uh, and, and what would your father think of, uh, or, or what would his words be about what's going on right now with the I police? think he would be uh, very disappointed. Uh, he spent 45 years of his life uh, protecting our city and protecting the institution of law and order. He went after crooked cops. He arrested crooked. Mm -hmm. he, they, they called him the cop that couldn't be bought. I think he would be disgusted on uh, the management of our city. Forget about the politics, where the city has gone post-COVID. I think any New Yorker would feel very disappointed in the city not being safe. And the city going back to, unfortunately, times in the 80s and the 70s that, I mean, forget about your politics. You look at what Mayor Giuliani did and what Mayor Bloomberg did and the, you know, uh, 16 years of government that they had law and order and you know, and wherever you are, I mean, I grew up in Brooklyn. I have a lot of African-American friends. Um, I think everybody wants to be safe, right? I have a lot of friends that are in Bed-Stuy and in Crown Heights. Nobody wants to see a city that, you know, crime is skyrocketing. Well, and, I agree completely, yeah. but I think we are living in a time where a priority for all of us is racial justice. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there were incidences yep. and, and maybe more than there should have been yep. where police officers were maybe over, for sure, overstepping Absolutely. boundaries. Absolutely. And so those police officers yep. need to be um, prosecuted. Absolutely. And, and they are, yep. and, but we need to come together yep. and we have to look at the police force, 95% yep. um, or, yeah. or higher, uh, most of the police officers are, are good police officers. Yep. And, and, and so it's unfortunate that this has happened. Yep. And it, sort of puts everyone um, on the defense yep. and on edge and um, it's too bad because we do need to have our cities safe. We do need racial justice. Yep. Uh, we just need a little correction, yeah. I think, and I think it'll happen. And um, 
Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm positive yeah. uh, moving forward. I yeah. think we're going to, with people like you, Vinny, yeah. we've, we've come much closer to yeah. uh, solving or dealing with yeah. this terrible, terrible pandemic. Yeah. And then when it comes to racial justice, yeah. I think we've gotten uh, where we're going. We're going soon, yeah. quick, in the right direction of making some positive changes in the police force, maybe a little bit better yeah. training and an understanding because, you know, one of the big problems with communication between people is just l is misunderstanding and, mm. and if people just sit at a table together and talk things out and then live together, things change. Mm. So and I think we're going in that direction and I think that's all very, very important. And did you ever want to follow in your father's footsteps? I have to say, you know, uh, my dad always steered me and my brother into other careers. I think his career, I mean, he was a Marine, 45 years in law enforcement, mm -hmm. NYPD. He was the executive assistant to the Brooklyn DA, Joe Hines, who is a legend in himself. We, you look at New York mm -hmm. City and Brooklyn in 1990, pro capital murders were up sky high in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is one of the safest areas to live right mm -hmm. now. That's why, as you know, everybody from the east side and west side Everybody wants to live in Brooklyn. Brooklyn's hot. Uh, I th he always pushed me and my brother um, to do. So my brother's a colonel in the Army, right? Uh, he's uh, stationed down in Ramstein Air Force Base. Uh, he's 82nd Airborne and uh, Ranger, and he's been three tours in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. So you're a and, family uh, of service. You've yeah. given a lot yeah. of service, which certainly goes under uh, philanthropy. What you've yeah. been doing is extraordinary, yeah. and uh, your whole family. And I, we find that uh, families, when if they're involved in uh, serving the United States or very involved in philanthropy, generally, it's passed down from generation to generation, which we see in your yeah. family, which is really wonderful. And we have a little bit of uh, uh, law enforcement in my family yeah. on my mother's side. My grandfather yeah. was a police officer, but we never speak about it. Yeah. And I'm not sure why my mother's deceased yeah. now, but I'm very proud. Yeah. And um, one other thing, um, getting back to the emergency task force, yeah. Going forward, there's going to continue to be a need. We don't know what's going to happen. Yep. All of us are on edge. People, you know, we still have to wear our masks. Yep. We're still social distancing, washing our hands. How can we help? Where, what, what's the website yep. to donate to your a group so mm. that our viewers can make a donation? And remember, Tiny donations make a big difference, $10, $20, $30, $100. And of course, if you are in a position to make a, write a big check, you absolutely must. And we're, we're in a crisis now like we've never been before. Looking forward, it looks much better, but this is not over. So what is the website? And then I want to hear about volunteering. Sure. So P Pave the Way Foundation It's a foundation I've served on. Uh, for many years. It's a, it's a Vatican foundation that works a lot with charitable work uh, throughout the country. Are, but um, are they spearheading this emergency task force? Yeah, so, for us? so what, what, what we're doing is everything is going through uh, Pave the Way Foundation. Okay. And then all the funds from Pave the Way then goes to uh, all the, uh, the food pantries. So it's important to know because it's a 501c3 not for profit. So it's 90, tax deductible. Tax deductible. Your donation. Basically, ninety percent of the money is all going to uh, food administrative. A so lot you have of people, a very low overhead. Very low because overhead. The, the guideline is, you know, if you have a charity, yeah. the overhead should be uh, twenty yeah. percent or less. And this charity, Pave the Way Foundation, is ten percent. So yeah. that's really wonderful. Yeah. And what's the website? So it's PaveTheWayFoundation.com. PaveTheWayFoundation.com. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. And what about volunteers? Are you accepting volunteers Absolutely. now to work in, at the food pantries? Absolutely. And, and are people safe? Because in the middle, in the early stages of yep. COVID, uh, what we saw was the food pantries were losing volunteers yep. because so many of the volunteers were in their 60s yep. and 70s. And this group was at high risk yep. for getting the COVID virus. So a lot of the um, volunteers at the food pantries all left their jobs, but now it's much safer, right? Yeah. And you're, you're getting more volunteers back, yeah. correct? So one thing with us, we do everything. We have mobile, the mobile van I, I spoke about with Serve right. Natural, so we're outside. So you can um, someone can drive the yeah, van yeah. or pack food or? Uh, we have volunteers, so at, at, for instance, the two, the two churches and locations we're doing. We have tables, we have gloves, we have sanitizer, we do the tape every six feet, everything social distance. 
Everybody has a mask, everybody has gloves, everybody has sanitizer. Obviously being outside, people feel much more comfortable being inside like a food pantry. The van shows up and we basically give the food right out of the van. The people that are waiting in line, you know, everybody's very patient, nobody's uh, on top of each other. And I think that for anybody that wants to volunteer, you're outside just like you would be outside waiting at a deli getting food. I mean, that's what I basically yeah. set it up. People waiting at a deli getting food or you go into the, you know, the cheese shop in Southampton. Same thing. We have a food truck. People are waiting to get food. They come up, they get their food, and they and go on their so way. And it's so true when you give, you get. Now, we yeah. have exactly one minute left. Yeah. What, what do you want to leave this audience with? Uh, you've done so many great things, yeah. but if someone truly wants to help, yeah. what, what advice do you give? I think now, if you see, you know, I've seen it in New York City. It's really like the have and have nots, right? And people so that, much. There's such a divide yeah. right and now, and we have lost. to make that... Um, yeah. that divide much uh, smaller. Yeah. So like, we like have me, to make our middle class strong. Yeah. Like me and everybody else, I think by volunteering, uh, I think it's a, it says something to people that can volunteer right now and help people. I think deep down it'll, it'll help them in, in them giving back. I, think I, don't, I don't think people I give agree. back enough. And you can, give, you, know, you can give a donation, and that's great, and we're very grateful for those donations. But I think when you actually do something tangible and you're on the ground and you see it, I had somebody that worked with us recently that uh, we've been doing this for months, right? In Robin Hood right now, we're waiting to get the uh, grant extended. And uh, the person came out the other day and we went to two homeless shelters in New York City. And one of them we went inside uh, in the heat of uh, Harlem. And the person saw the tangible work that we were yes, doing. Yes, I think when you're uh, actually involved, you, you feel so fulfilled. Yeah. This concludes Successful Philanthropy. I'm Jean Schaffer, your host. Today with us was Vinnie Levine, the head of the Catholic Church's Emergency Task Force in New York City. I look forward to seeing you next week.